So, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Uh, welcome everyone uh, in Bio 415, uh, which is basically developmental biology. You may have gone through uh, the course outline. All the lectures will be uh, live. I will not record and, and place them on the uh, On, on YouTube. I may give you some lectures as, uh, you know, extra reading if I found that, you know, there is need for additional uh, material. So I may send you some links, uh, but I'll see as we move on. Uh, the course is uh, divided in such a way. So you have two hours lecture, but uh, in the beginning, we'll have uh, two such lecture, uh, two hours lecture, um, uh, but soon we are going to decide uh, rather today or in the next lecture, we are going to decide uh, 50 minutes recitation, okay? And that recitation, uh, which is in the outline here, if, you, if my cursor is visible to you, so that recitation will be basically where you are going to discuss the research papers, okay? Each one of you will be part of a group. I think we are total 16 or 18 students. So research papers uh, makes a very important component of this course. Um, and it's, it's a major chunk. I think nearly it makes up 20% of uh, overall uh, evaluation or weightage in the final grade. The idea of research papers is uh, developmental biology is uh, otherwise is uh, a lot of theory, unless you don't understand uh, how to understand uh, development of uh, organism from, in, in case of multicellular organisms, from single cell to a multicellular organism, you won't be able to uh, learn much out of developmental biology. And the best way to learn these processes is basically by reading papers critically. Their methodology, their results, then going go through their discussion. <clears throat> so it serves two, two purposes. One is you learn how to tackle a question which is related to developmental biology. And then second uh, is basically how uh, you, you are going to um, develop or define new questions in developmental biology. So as I said earlier, uh, as soon as we'll start reading research papers, uh, one research paper every week, uh, each one of you will be part of a group. As a group, you will uh, discuss those papers. Ahmad uh, is my teaching assistant, uh, and he will lead that. Uh, discussion group. Now, the whole course revolves around basically uh, the theme, which is uh, development of multicellular organisms. How you grow from fertilized egg, uh, from process of fertilization to uh, you know, going through different stages of development, which uh, in earlier introductory biology course, you learned about, you know, uh, different germ layers, you know, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm, you know, before that you, you go through blast, blastocyst stage, then gastrulation, neurulation. So all this journey from uh, single cell to multicellularity, and then 
the establishment of fades of uh, different cell lineages and how they are maintained. How different cell lineages, they perform their function and how uh, can we change the cell fate? Um, how, you know, a continuous supply of cells in case of differentiated cells, for example, you have gut, you have blood. I mean, you will talk about the uh, stem cells there in the uh, lectures after midterm. But uh, we'll start with basically um, fundamental concepts in the first two, three lectures, because it's very important to understand terminology and tools of development and then uh, bring everything in the context of cellular signaling. Uh, you know, developmental biology is basically, uh, you know, it's, it lies at the heart of uh, genetics, molecular biology, cell biology, and biochemistry. And out of all of them, uh, you know, cell signaling plays a, a pivotal role. Uh, during development. Now, if we have to understand development, if we have to define a new question, for example, uh, you want to understand the uh, function of a certain cell type, for example, neurons in, in, uh, in humans or mouse, or, you know, you are, you are working in neuroscience you will most likely go through uh, genomics, uh, functional genomics approach. Uh, the overarching theme of this whole course will be where I, I'll mostly emphasize will be uh, genetic basis of development. Because if we are able to define a question and then we want to answer that particular question, you know, we, we go through mostly uh, in genetics creation of mutants. But generation of mutant is not enough. You have to, the real fun in developmental biology or in biology is when you characterize that mutant, when you use all different tools to understand the function of the gene which you have discovered. So here we are not going to uh, talk about core genetics, here we are going to use different tools to answer the questions we are interested in, to characterize different mutants. So if during the course, during lectures, if anything is not clear, you can stop me anytime and you can ask questions. Um, as I said, the uh, basic purpose of the course is uh, genetic, molecular, and biochemical basis of development. Um, then you will also uh, be introduced to evolutionary conserved molecular and biochemical pathways. Um, development is, uh, the beauty of learning development is, you will see from simple, organisms to complex organisms, it's more or less the same toolkit, uh, same set of genes uh, which are evolutionarily conserved. And, you know, uh, the, it's same toolkit which gives, for example, anterior, posterior uh, body access formation in invertebrates and it's conserved in vertebrates. And then even, uh, you know, the symmetry in flowers, it's the same genes. So you will appreciate during this course, you know, how uh, nature has conserved uh, this developmental toolkit. Uh, as I already said, we'll also go through uh, classical and cutting edge research articles, <clears throat> which will help you understand the development. Um, I already said this, but let's uh, again emphasize that uh, at the end of this course, uh, I strongly believe that uh, 
you will be able to understand development from fertilized egg uh, to multicellular organism. Uh, you will be able to, you know, understand the uh, link between gene regulation, cell signaling, different uh, developmental pathways, uh, their role in uh, development of an organism and in particular uh, specific cell types and cell lineages. So <clears throat> my uh, dream is, and whenever I teach this course, my dream is that uh, students who go through this course, they should be able to uh, define question of their interest uh, by the end of this course. They should be able to define uh, a question in developmental biology, which may be interesting to them. And then they should know how to answer this question. And that's where research papers play a lot of uh, role in, in, in that learning process. As I said, research papers are major components. So assignments are basically the research papers. So read them really well. Uh, we mark them within the recitation. Then there will be quiz, 5% uh, will be quiz. Uh, and then we have midterm and final exam, 40% each. And grading is uh, absolute, okay? Uh, there will be two exams, mid and final. And both are very conceptual as the kind of exams that I, I usually make. So um, the book we are going to have is uh, Volpert. Uh, and we'll cover different topics. From today, we are going to start, uh, you know, the fundamental tools and the concepts in uh, developmental biology. Uh, an important thing is whenever you write an email, whenever you share something with us, um, you are going to write an email to myself and Ahmad both. Uh, keep me CC or Ahmad CC whenever you write. And uh, also, um, we may, uh, Whenever you submit an assignment or any work related to this course, uh, you know, you should have your LUMS ID, uh, underscore your name, underscore bio415, okay? So that we get so many files, uh, we are able to sort them easily that these are bio415 uh, students who are contacting us your answer sheets, whatever you send, it should contain when you write an email in the subject, uh, your file name, which you attach, should be containing your uh, LUMS ID plus bio415, uh, as well as the email subject should also uh, have bio415 as the subject. Okay, so any questions? Any questions? Okay, then we start today's lecture. Um, let me share my... Uh, Slides. Can you all see my screen? Okay. So, <clears throat> as I said, we are going to uh, talk about. Um, some history tools and concepts which are very important and first three lectures or so uh, up to cell signaling. Uh, this is very important because we are going to bring everything in, in the context of, uh, of development uh, so that you know your previous concepts they, they, they become 
uh, refreshed as well. They are refreshed as well. So <clears throat> today's lecture is about uh, brief history. It's, it's a very interesting uh, subject. It's, uh, and the history is even more interesting, uh, how we have uh, arrived at the kind of uh, developmental biology which we are going to learn, start learning today, because in the past it was uh, embryology. And they were just trying to understand the embryo development. But with the advent of uh, recombinant DNA technology, molecular biology, genetics, and you know biochemistry, etc., the, they all amalgamate to to make uh, developmental biology very fascinating. We are also going to talk about uh, about the model systems uh, because without the model systems, we won't be able to understand development. And then, of course, concepts and tools. Uh, <clears throat> the question about our own existence is as old as, as the humans. Uh, but systematically, or you know, scientific approach uh, to answer this question about how we develop, uh, it, it's you know, uh, started from the times of Aristotle and, and the debate uh, which started in uh, in ancient times uh, by Aristotle and others. Uh, this remained uh, uh, a very intense debate all the way up to 17th and 18th century and two theories, two dominant theories uh, they uh, prevailed. One was called uh, preformation and the other was called epigenesis. Epigenesis came much late um, Aristotle and his, his uh, colleagues that time, they thought we come uh, preformed. Uh, you know, um, humans, they are already, uh, some structures are formed, miniaturized humans are formed, and uh, that miniaturized human was called homunculus. Uh, that one of the scientist in those times <clears throat> or philosopher he even claimed that you know i could see in the sperm head so this is a drawing of, of a, a sperm cell that you know he said within the sperm head uh, a tiny baby uh, is already formed and they they call this homunculus uh, this theory <clears throat> which uh, Propose that you know we are preformed is of course then later on called theory of preformation, and it dominated. Uh, you can see all the way to 17th century, 18th century. So epigenesis came much late, uh, which was a counter or contrast to preformation. And epigenesis uh, proposed that no, we are not preformed, rather, we develop uh, as we grow. So, epigenesis uh, proposed, you know, development upon formation, that embryo development uh, is very simple in the beginning. Uh, it's no, not in the form of homunculus. Uh, may, we cannot even see anything. Uh, there and uh, as we develop uh, from uh, sperm and egg cells fusion you know then we uh, from this relative simple beginning we become more complex uh, but it was not easy to convince uh, the other school of thought <clears throat> however with the Discovery of cell theory by uh, Schleiden and Schoen, which proposed that you know every living cell it arises from pre-existing living cells, and cells are uh, cell is basically the fundamental unit of life. That then pretty much uh, proved and um, you know convinced everyone that you know uh, there's no concept of preformation in our development rather it's the epigenesis and we grow uh, uh, we develop as we grow 
and also uh, after cell division we also learned eventually that egg is a very very specialized cell type uh, we have many cell types in living organisms but egg is uh, the uh, unique cell in living organisms which has the potential to support development of a complete living organism as compared to um, other cell types. Um, so uh, development, uh, it is an epigenetic process or it's, it's, uh, it goes through process of epigenesis. August wise, when uh, um, in 19th century, uh, when talking, talk, when he talked about different cell lineages or cell types, he did a, a wonderful experiment to distinguish different kinds of cells we harbor. And uh, he said we have uh, soma and the germ lines, somatic and the germ cells. Um, and you know, somatic cells. Uh, they are responsible for our, all the multicellularity we contain in our uh, body. But germline is the one which is responsible for continuity of the life. So here in this beautiful cartoon from, uh, from Walpert, uh, Principles of Development, you can see that zygote uh, after fertilization, uh, so according to Wiseman, so there will be cell types which will be separated, which will be kept protected from the other cell types. Uh, and they are the ones which are responsible for continuity of the life. And these cells are germ cells, okay? From these germ cells, uh, you know, during early development, when they are not yet fully established as germ cells. The distinction between somatic cell lineage and uh, germ cell takes place from a common ancestor in our development. And then you have, uh, you know, these somatic cells, you can see these are uh, showing uh, different cell lineages, different differentiated cell types, which eventually lead to development of a multicellular organism. Why he had to show this? Because those were the days when uh, there was a famous discussion or debate between uh, what was going on between uh, acquired traits and uh, inherited traits. Now, in case of, uh, you know, acquired traits, uh, acquired traits. These are the traits which we acquire uh, in response to, you know, environmental uh, pressure or for example, you know, the debate was basically uh, nature and nurture kind of uh, questions going on and uh, Lamarck uh, led a theory. Uh, I love that theory actually. Uh, Lamarck proposed that, you know, environmental pressure or selection pressure uh, actually lead to certain traits, development of certain traits in living organisms, which are then uh, inherited through uh, generations. Uh, once they get selected, they are then passed on from generation after generation. And that's how the process of evolution is driven. Um, what Wiseman did, uh, he did a beautiful experiment. He, I think, took a mouse and he clipped its tail for like 26 generations. Now, uh, he's I mean, they, they said, look, we are putting an environmental uh, accident, uh, a pressure in which we are clipping the tail of mouse 
and uh, up to 26 generation you know all the newborns pups of mouse they are normal their tails are not uh, you know truncated they are normal they are born with normal tails and this led to the proposal of uh, distinction between soma and the germ line that you know uh, any mutation which uh, may occur, uh, let's say, in the somatic cells, so that will be inherited to the somatic cells. Let's say a mutation occurs and that leads to cancer, for example. Now, that mutation, if that is leading to cancer, let's say skin cancer, oral cancer, whatever, that will be in this particular individual which carries this mutation in somatic tissue. But this mutation will not be passed on through the uh, germline to the next project. Okay. However, if the mutation happens in the germline, let's say if it occurs here in the germline, then this mutation will be passed on to next generation with, which will go in somatic cells as well as germline and generation after generation you will have this mutation. And that's the only way through which traits are inherited. So traits are, so the, the distinction between acquired traits and inherited traits is that acquired traits are basically they are acquired in response to certain selection pressure in organisms. And there are experiments by uh, Conrad uh, Waddington that was in uh, Waddington in 1940s onward, in which he showed that if he gives continuous heat shock to the uh, fruit flies, uh, you know, up to 10 generation, he gives heat shock to, uh, you know, early embryonic stage flies and uh, they develop a special wing phenotype. And after 10 or 14 generations, when he stopped giving heat shock, that trait gets fixed. That is, and he used a very specialized term. He, he coined a term called canalization. Okay. Um, canalization. That the mutation become fixed. Now you don't need this stimulus of heat shock. He did a few other beautiful experiments as well. And uh, he was the first one to use the word development is indeed epigenetic. Uh, that epigenetic word had nothing to do with the epigenetics which we do today, but the concepts are pretty much same. He was uh, ahead of his time, what he proposed. So uh, the fundamental distinction between uh, soma, somatic cells and germ cells, so germ cells, they provide the continuity of the life and somatic cells, they are the ones which are, uh, are make up our body. So somatic cells are basically diploid, germ cells are haploids. Uh, germ cells are basically the, uh, um, what we call uh, egg cell and sperm cell, okay? and they are definitely product of meiosis we know today. And, uh, you know, you have um, egg plus sperm that makes a zygote, which is 2N. So uh, 1N plus 1N, which are product of meiosis. And from here, this 2N, which is a zygote, it undergoes mitosis successive mitotic divisions and, you know, uh, develops as an embryo. So they, uh, people who were involved in this debate, uh, they, what they did, they uh, 
to see our channel. It's a simple organism in oceans. And uh, they, they knew that, you know, uh, they learned that CH and development requires two nuclei, one coming from sperm and the other coming from uh, the egg cell. And uh, they also knew that, you know, by this time in 19th century, Mendelian uh, laws were already the which established the physical basis of the genetic inheritance uh, uh, traits that traits are controlled by specific uh, factors within uh, cells they were also known so once uh, we learned about egg cell and sperm cell uh, together with you know cell theory and mendelian uh, factors which today we know as genes uh, they the conclusion was that you know cellular nucleus egg and sperm they must contain something and that something was definitely what Mendel proposed and we learned in early past uh, early part of 20th century that these are genes uh, which are fundamental basis of heredity so all the focus then uh, went on to understanding genes which control development. Um, but it was a big question how, uh, you know, you go from pretty simple beginning, uh, which is this one, uh, you know, a fertilized egg, just a, a mix of two cells, um, egg and mm, uh, oocyte and, and sperm and how you know you go um, and different cell types or fates of different cell types uh, is established uh, and once cell fate is established uh, you know how different cell lineages are established for example live uh, later on you you have um, already we said, if you paid attention here, we already said, you know, there is an early on distinction between uh, germ cells and somatic cells. So here, how, you know, at what time and how, uh, you know, after successive mitosis, this distinction takes place that, you know, uh, there will be cells which will go and lead to development of germ cells. They will be protected from all the mitotic signals. So they will never undergo mitosis. They will be channelized in meiosis. And how then all the others receive signals to keep dividing mitosis. Um, we will uh, learn about all this in this course. Um, and But the important thing is that this stage where we have, you know, a distinction, uh, this we in developmental biology, we call this cell fate determination. Cell fate determination. So fates of different cells. So this, I just try to draw fertilized egg, then, you know, cells divided mitotically. This is, you know, a clump of cells. And there is this developmental cell signaling going on, which distinguishes, although the cell shape, all their shape looks pretty much same. But uh, within cellular circuit or developmental circuit, there is distinction. And they commit, they commit to specific uh, cell fates in this early stage is called cell fate determination and then onward journey takes place where you know once they commit to a specific cell fate uh, these multiple arrows are basically uh, indicating successive mitotic divisions before eventually they differentiate and this stage is then called differentiation when they physically also become 
clearly different, distinguished, and there is no way you cannot go back from this journey to this early stage or to this early stage. For example, our digits, my eyes, my nose, my blood cells, my uh, skin cells, my gut, liver, kidney, they are Termi that's terminal differentiation. Terminal differentiation means, so one is differentiation when they start looking different. They, for example, in, in case of um, an embryo, if I try to draw an embryo, uh, the, our limbs, the, the arms, they are initially just a dot. Few cells commit to this stage, this red dot, okay? And then eventually you see we have this uh, arm well formed on, this is terminal differentiation. So all the development, what we are going to learn in this course is actually this early stage development because it's very important to understand how cell fates are determined, how the process of differentiation takes place, how, uh, at this early stage, uh, this one, how at this stage, you know, distinction between different cell fates are being, uh, cell fate, fates is being established. So once cell fates are established or cell fates are determined, then each cell, each cell, it remembers that my cell fate is, for example, I, I have to contribute to liver function. And then eventually they differentiate. I have to contribute to kidney. So each cell through mitosis remembers. It's a beautiful field. All this is happening at the epigenetic level. So in, in 21st century, for example, you know, the major questions which uh, we are learning or we are trying to address in developmental biology is, uh, how cells arise from single fertilized egg uh, and how they can become different as well. You know, um, all of them contain uh, single fertilized egg. All of them contain same 46 chromosomes in human. Uh, all the cell types which inherit these 46 chromosomes, um, how they are becoming different from one another. This is a very fascinating question and that's um, at the heart of development. Um, then of course, how do uh, these cells, they organize? Uh, and when I say organize in case of developmental biology, in case of devel development of eukaryotic organisms, uh, organization has very special meaning. Uh, look in our brain, there are uh, neurons, like their cells, they are neuronal, non-neuronal cells. Each cell type in our brain is uh, performing a dedicated function. In our heart also, we have some neurons. Uh, how the whole gut, the digestive tract system is established. All this is organization. Um, I think one of the uh, interesting example in development is, um, the kind of cells and the cell types which are present in our arms and legs are same. You know, we have skeletal muscles, we have, you know, uh, same uh, distal and the uh, proximal end. Then we have, you know, these digits. And then in our uh, legs, we have uh, toes. So if, if you pay attention, they both are, uh, same, their, their pattern formation looks pretty much same, but they develop differently. Uh, so how different cell types, they organize into structures, uh, how different structures are formed. And uh, that's also uh, a beautiful uh, area in, in development. Um, for example, fruit flies have been used as a, uh, to as a, as a system for understanding development. And many genes which we have discovered in fruit flies, which play a role in uh, body excess formation or morphogenesis, they are conserved in humans. 
and conserved at the level of function. And it's amazing. Fruit fly is invertebrate. We are vertebrates. Uh, we look, there's no similarity at the organismal level. But deep down at developmental toolkit, as I said, uh, that's evolutionary conserved. And that's these are uh, questions which are being addressed these days. And we'll continue uh, understanding these uh, organizational and pattern formation uh, questions in the future. Then, of course, what controls behavior of individuals? So, uh, as I said, uh, you know, a highly organized pattern emerge from a relatively simple beginning. Uh, we start our life from fertilized egg, then even, you know, all the way up to gastrulation, uh, you know, I still call this relatively simple beginning. But then, you know, we start seeing distinction between three major classes of cell types, which we call germ layers. Make sure you don't confuse germ cells and germ layers. Germ layers are uh, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, the earliest distinction between three cell types, uh, which we develop at the time of gastrulation. So how, how uh, uh, cellular behavior is established and how it is controlled, which eventually contribute to uh, pattern formation. Uh, then, of course, how are the organizing principles of development and they are embedded? That's the core of development. Uh, because as we learned earlier, egg is a very specialized cell type. Um, you know, what are the, uh, what is special in the egg cell? That an egg cell only contributes or supports the complete development of a multicellular organism or unicellular organism. Uh, in case of unicellular, uh, we don't have egg and uh, um, what we call the sperm cells, like in case of unicellular eukaryote, the simple eukaryote is yeast. It simply different, uh, develops through budding. But in multicellular organisms, when where we have egg and sperm, um, be it plants, uh, animals. You know, it's the egg cell which uh, can support development of all whole organism, not our somatic cells. Uh, you take somatic cell, you try to use it in development, you won't be able to establish complete new organism unless you uh, go through uh, the latest uh, stem cell uh, or, or the uh, what we call the nuclear reprogramming. Otherwise, somatic cells, they cannot uh, support development. And epigenetic uh, or epigenetics is uh, actually a new surprise to all of us in the last 20 years that, you know, uh, so different cell types, they, uh, when they differentiate, they, their cell fates are established. You know, these, all of them contain same 46 chromosomes, but they become different because they become different at the level of epigenetics. Uh, their differential gene expression is, is what, uh, so when we have, uh, same fertilized egg, but uh, you know, different cell types, let's say during development established. Now each cell type, it uh, contains 46 uh, uh, chromosomes. So how they become different from each other uh, is actually uh, epigenetic phenomenon. Um, all of them contain nearly same set of 20,000 genes because they contain all 46 chromosomes. But the differential gene expression pattern, which is established, so genes which are established in this cell line and give identity to this cell type will be off in these ones and vice versa. And that's our distinction between different cell types is established. Um, and what we have learned in last 20 years is that you know 
stem cells and the difference between stem cells and differentiated cells again epigenetics is involved uh, if you want to you know use developmental tools like for example stem cells as medicine uh, you know there are certain ethical uh, reasons that we cannot uh, use embryonic stem cells but what people are doing they are using differentiated cells and reprogramming them using epigenetics as tool and trying to develop personalized medicine uh, in the form of you know regenerative medicine in, in the form of stem cell therapies okay so we will understand uh, during this course uh, development a lot of emphasis will be uh, through uh, genetic control mechanisms uh, but uh, i would say um, most of the time in the later part of this course we will be focusing on epigenetic phenomena so these are uh, seven uh, different friends of humans we call because without these uh, friends we could not uh, answer any of the questions we are talking about in development uh, early on people use xenopus and the frog uh, chick embryos were also because this is a vertebrate this is also vertebrate model this they were very helpful um, mouse that is evolutionary very close to us uh, the genome and, and the different uh, uh, genes homology between mouse genes and uh, human genes is, is very very high uh, more recently uh, zebra fish in i think last 20 years uh, another vertebrate model uh, got introduced into the labs and you may be wondering what a rabbit ops is you know did uh, in understanding human development remember as molecular biologist as as a dna scientist whether you are working with plants or you are working with uh, mouse or humans there is no distinction whether you know because the basic principles of development and life are same uh, development deals with pattern formation development deals with organization and these model systems they generate basic knowledge they give us idea how a different altogether different system is tackling same question of pattern formation and or, uh, tissue organization etc uh, c elegans is uh, invertebrate model uh, i think those of you who were in um in last seminar by uh, professor grossens helge grossens uh, um, they must have appreciated how c elegans may have contributed or is it conti it continues to uh, contribute to our understanding and development i would say that and i would like to announce that all of you all of you all the students in this course it is mandatory for all of you to go to the seminars which are being organized by our department and they are live on facebook and there will be no excuse uh, because we place their recording on the server as well they are present on uh on the facebook as well as sse youtube channel if you are actually going to understand this subject you are going to understand more through the seminars than maybe my lectures my lectures will be extremely helpful in your understanding the seminar but the real understanding about development comes from research papers which you will uh read but these seminars will contribute i think initially you may find it difficult but keep going okay uh there are already um uh 
two seminars on the uh, server on the Facebook as well. Ahmad, you send them the links. One for uh, from the Helge Grossens, which was about developmental clock. Okay. And then second was by uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, it was John. Uh, I think John or uh, he was from US. He talked about uh, diabetes development. Okay. So watch these two in your spare time. Don't miss that. I'll get back to you. Uh, and the quizzes I will establish, I'll uh, uh, develop. They may contain questions from the seminars I recommend during my lectures. Okay. So developmental clock and uh, the other seminar was about diabetes and you know regeneration, regenerative medicine, etc. Stem cell therapy in diabetes, beta cells, etc. So, sorry. Now let's uh, get back to what is time now? What is time now? because I want to take 10 minutes, uh, five minutes break. It's 11 o'clock. It's 11, so it's time for the break. So let's take break here, okay? And we reassemble in, our class is till 11.50, I think. Yeah, so let's then meet, uh, my computer is showing 11 or 3. So 11.13, okay? Let's meet in 11.13, in 10 minutes from now.
Okay, so we are back. Please switch on your cameras so that I know you're still there and I'm not talking to a blank screen. So can you see my screen? Okay. So, as I said during early uh, attempts to understand the development, uh, Xenopus uh, that served as an excellent model system because the simple reason was the oversight was big enough, and you know uh, the morphological changes could be visualized in that uh, relatively bigger oversight. So it's uh, the, the life cycle which is described on, on this uh, slide is pretty much conserved in the way the developmental stages basically in the uh, vertebrates. For example, here you see the uh, sperm cell and the oocyte, they fuse, they make a zygote. Uh, this is the process of fertilization, uh, the first stage. Then it undergoes mitosis, you see <clears throat> two cells, then it undergoes two cells divide mitotically to four to eight to 16. So the earliest cell divisions, uh, which are very fast without an intervening phase of growth, the overall size of the embryo more or less remain the same, but the number of embryos, they, they, they become more and more. And these specialized cell divisions are called cleavage divisions. At the end of cleavage, we have cleavage divisions, we have a fluid filled cavity, uh, which is referred to as uh, blastocil, C-O-E-L. And uh, embryo at this particular stage is also referred to as blastocyst stage. And this is blastula. Um, so from here at, at the after blastula, uh, what happens here you can see uh, this disc shaped organized uh, cells. These are called ICM or inner cell mass. Inner cell mass. They are basically all the cells which make uh, oocyte or all the cells which make us and then there are cells which are the, all these cells, they are non-embryonic or extra-embryonic cells. In humans, uh, they are uh, called trophectoderm cells, okay? And in, in humans, trophectoderm cells, they are actually involved in developing the placenta, a connection with our mothers, okay? So inner cell mass, they contain all the cells which uh, develop into an organism. However, if you pay attention, uh, all the cells here after blastocysts, the cavity is becoming smaller and smaller. If you follow from here all the way to here. So this is the stage where cell division uh, temporarily stop and all the cells, they start reorganizing them. So they start moving within the embryo and embryo from two dimension becomes a three dimensional structure and is organized into three different layers which are referred to as ectoderm, endoderm, mesoderm. So ecto means outer layer, meso is the middle and endo is the internal layer of cells. But this is not just where they are organized because as they are moving, sometimes ectodermal cells may also uh, be within because it's, it's just the organization. It's the large scale uh, movement of the cells. It's the kind of cell types which originate from these uh, germ layers. So these collectively, these three are called germ layers. Don't confuse them with germ cells. For example, mesodermal cells, they give rise to muscle and cartilage, bone, heart, blood, kidney. Uh, ectoderm gives rise to epidermis, the skin, etc. Uh, nervous system comes from epidermal cells. 
endoderm gives you internal organs, for example, gut, lungs, and liver. This is the first or the earliest sign of self-aid determination. Recently, I, I uh, saw a paper from Wolf, Wolf Reich's lab uh, in, in Bebraham, UK. Um, during last 11 years, I had been teaching this course and whenever I uh, used to teach in the earlier years in 2009 or so, at this particular stage, I used to wonder, you know, you know, these cells, they give rise to different uh, cell lineages later on. But at this stage, they all morphologically look same, okay? So can we capture their differential gene expression? Can we, you know, somehow as, as molecular biologists, can we understand if at the gene expression level, they have become different? And last year I saw a beautiful paper from, from Wolf's lab, what they showed that they just uh, took embryo at this particular stage where you have ecto, meso and endodermal cells. And they did single cell, single cell transcriptomic. Means they picked up, let's say they, they had 10,000 cells, hypothetically. They captured single cell and they did RNA seq. RNA seq means total RNA, and then RNA will tell you which genes are expressed and which genes are silent. It was beautiful and exactly the way I used to imagine. They showed those they, in an unbiased way when based on their RNA seq data, they clustered, they found three clusters. Three clear clusters based on just because these are single cells and they had no idea which one belongs to which, but based on the gene expression level, they could show okay, this is the ectodermal line, uh, cluster, endo, meso, etc. Go and find this. This is beautiful paper. And uh, so, what we learned that gastrulation not only involves the reorganization of the cells in different cell types, uh, and also, you know, embryo become from two dimension to three dimension structure. This is basically, in my opinion, is the first stage where we have very clearly defined three cell fates established. And from these early cell fates, you see a relatively simple beginning. Still, these cells, they have enormous potential and they will contribute to further specific lineages. Their fates will be further determined in later development, okay? So after this, uh, embryo looks slightly in an in a oblong shape and after this gastrulation where you know cells are moving from outside to inside etc eventually what we see we see a slight depression here which is a line uh, where i draw this uh, line so this is basically cells from outside ectodermal cells are moving inward and they are so rapid they are so fast that you know you see just a, a furrow and this furrow extends all the way from anterior to posterior. It goes all the way from there to there. And this is the earliest uh, sign of neurulation. The brain is developing, the earliest brain is developing. And at the end of neurulation, uh, we see you know, a clear head, anterior side, posterior side, a dot-like, eye-like structure and then you have uh, a spine, which is part of earlier brain. This stage is called organogenesis, where organs are uh, being established. And then in Xenopus, we have this metamorphosis where initially it looks like a tiny fish, uh, which is the tadpole stage, and eventually it loses uh, this and you have uh, adult is formed. Here, if you pay attention, um, you have um, these uh, 
you know, germline cells, they are protected. They are protected from all the other cell types because organism, it wants to protect them from any mitogenic signal. They don't have to go through mitosis. They will be going through meiosis. So when you look at these intricacies of development, uh, you know, as we learn this, this whole, whole process of development, many times you won't be uh, able to stop saying subhanallah because i mean the way whole developmental toolkit or machinery is being used the i call this precision engineering is is being implemented it's far more complex and far more precise than a supercomputer or a circuit a precision guided whatever tool you you develop uh, now, what Wiseman suggested uh, when he proposed epigenesis, and you know, uh, he also proposed the nuclear factors. He said, you know, we start life from a relatively simple beginning and we develop upon formation. Uh, so after fertilization, so what he proposed that, you know, you are nucleus, it contains uh, determinants, factors, very crucial determinants and these determinants are going to develop sorry are going to contribute to development these are master today we know these are like master regulators of development in 21st century in last in in the last quarter of last century we started using word master control of development or uh, uh, master control of developmental clocks blah 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 so idea was that although he had no idea in, in his times, we had no idea about DNA or chromosomes or genes, but the genius in Wiseman proposed that, you know, there are determinants within the uh, fertilized egg, which after cell division, uh, you know, they are divided in such a way that these determinants then lead to uh, establishment or commitment of different kind of cells we are going to harbor and these nuclear determinants they are actually uh, <clears throat> then be the cause of complexity we achieve as multicellular organisms and this kind of developmental model was called mosaic model of development it's, it's a mosaic you know you have different determinants then they are being distributed uh, differently and then eventually you have uh, a mosaic being developed which collectively or together lead to uh, a perfect process of development and these nuclear determinants they are actually present only in zygote they are not in our somatic cells uh, in in last uh, part of the 20th century we also learned that the cytoplasm of oocyte contains something special. Remember Dolly, the sheep, the, the clone sheep uh, experiment? What they did, they simply took somatic cell, took its nucleus and implanted it within a uh, uh, oocyte. They removed the nucleus of the oocyte replaced it with nucleus of cytoplasm uh, of a somatic cell the biggest conclusion of that experiment was that the oocyte contains something which can reprogram even the nucleus of a differentiated somatic cell which was the skin cell udder cell in that case so it means the oocyte contains some determinants uh, based on our latest knowledge and Wiseman proposed these as, uh, as nuclear determinants. Uh, this was then demonstrated successfully by Willem Rox, uh, who simply took uh, uh, the embryo, uh, frog embryo. And what he did at two cell stage, he took a hot needle and with a hot needle, because the frog oocyte is big enough, he 
with a hot needle, he killed one of the two cells. So this cell become it dead. The other was alive. Now from this alive cell, what they saw that half embryo developed. And Willem Rock said, yeah, the nuclear determinant model, the mosaic model of uh, Weizmann is correct because you know you have lost half of the uh, nuclear determinants by losing one of the cells. So that's why only half of the embryo developed because mosaic is collapsed now. Okay. So he also supported the mosaic model of development. However, um, Hans Trish, uh, while using the sea urchin, sea urchin is, was also is still in some of the labs, but in earlier uh, era of developmental biology, was very favorite organism because you know big embryo and, and simple organism. What he showed that you know if I uh, separate the two cell stage at two cell stage. So this is CH and embryo, two cell stage. If he develops, you know, this is the normal CH developing. Okay. Uh, you can see this is the CH and looks like. But he said if I separate one of the two, still normal CH, although not of the same size, but reduced size CH can develop. So he said development is not mosaic, you know, in case of mosaic is that you have uh, cells having different determinants, they contribute to development of complete organism. And if one of the determinant will be missing, development will be skewed. In case of uh, regulated development, and this is called regulated model of development, uh, he said, he proposed that no, even if you know, few of the determinants, in case they are determinants, uh, in case of uh, mosaic model, if you are missing, the rest can compensate. Uh, and they interact with each other. Uh, it means the interaction of the cells. So here cells, they realize we lost one. They interacted with one another. They talk to each other and they led to development of an embryo. So it means, I mean, Drish proposed that development is not mosaic, it's regulated, or this was called regulation. So cells must be interacting to compensate for loss of uh, whatever factors we, we may have uh, lost by removing one of the cells. This was further, uh, however, let me also uh, clarify both the models in different species is true. For example, in um, you know, uh, in Xenopus it's regulated, in CHN it's it's uh, sorry, in Xenopus it's mosaic, and here it's uh, regulated. Um, what Beeman uh, showed was it. It was something very interesting. Uh, he uh, simply took. Um, and these are uh, experiments. I don't exactly remember the year, but it's like 19th century experiments. Uh, what he showed that, um, you know, if you take few cells uh, from early stage embryo and graph them, so here are those cells, a uh, piece of uh, graft which contains cells, and you know, graph them on same stage. So this is, let's say, blastocyst stage. You graph them same stage embryo, but on a different location. And when the development proceeds, what they found that this graft resulted in development of a embryo. With, this is the normal embryo this big one, but this graft, it led to development of another small sized embryo within the other embryo. And this is Spiemann's experiment, which proved that development is regulation. So cells are talking to each other. So this cell 
this graph, this piece of graph, it does not contain all the nuclear determinants which Wiseman was talking about, but it led to development of uh, independent embryo, which means there is communication going on between cells of the host embryo and this piece. What was very important, this region was called Spiemann's organizer. This is called blaster, dorsal lip of the blaster pore. Cells, I mean, idea was that since it, because a graph from here, a graph from here or here, it did not result in development of embryo. Only of this region led to development of embryo. So this is something um, when I look at this critically, we have to look at things and results and experiments critically. When I look at this experiment, I say, okay, it on the one hand, it proves regulation of development, which uh, Hans Trisch proposed, but it also highlights some determinants because cells here are only able to produce such embryo, not this one, this one, this one. So it means there are some determinants which are responsible for development of a complete embryo. So it means mosaic model is also true. So you don't have to go with mosaic and regulation as a, as a two independent school of thoughts. They were just experiments. They were just learning experiences during early years. But today when you see development of same organism you will find in development of tissues and organs. Yeah, here it's regulation, here it is, you know, mosaic model, okay? It's true in, in modern uh, developmental biology. Yeah, I explained you, so it's a dorsal lip of the blastopore. Uh, and what is dorsal lip of blastopore? This is the stage, let me go back on, here it is, this stage. When, after blastocyst, when gastrulation takes place, gastrulation takes place by, if I try to draw, my drawing is not so good. So we have a two-dimensional embryo, okay? Just cells are organized like layers. Now, from this particular point, this one, this is the blast, uh, dorsal lip of the blast. These cells, ectodermal cells, they start moving inward like this in direction of my arrow. This is what makes mesoderm and then endoderm, et cetera. Here you see ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. This particular point is called dorsal lip of blastopore. Here there are cells which are called bottle cells. They become bottle shaped, constricted, and the physical forces due to change in cell shape, physical forces are exerted, which results in travel of these cells inwards. So this is what uh, the graph from here only resulted in uh, production of an uh, embryo. This small grafted region is called Spiemann's organizer because I mean, they named it organizer because it can organize a complete embryo. There is something special there. Uh, since it controls the organization of complete embryo, that's why it was called Spiemann's organizer. And this was the first ever uh, experiment which discovered uh, induction phenomenon. Induction means here in the embryo, normally at this location, no embryo formation takes place. But these cells, the Spiemann's organizer, when they came here, they talked to the host cells, they induced a structure, an embryonic structure, which is not supposed to develop here. So there is cell-to-cell -cell communication going on. And these early stage Spiemann organizer graft could induce a complete embryo here. And that is what is referred to as induction phenomenon. Induction experiment was all, this was also induction here, uh, if you see, because you know, you lose one cell and then the others could induce complete embryo. But uh, 
Spiemann was the uh, first time which actually experimentally showed uh, the induction uh, phenomenon. Uh, Drish just, just proposed this. So with that, we are done with today's lecture. Uh, I repeat again, please go back and uh, watch Helge Grossens seminar. And also, uh, I forgot the name. Ahmad, uh, Abdullah, you have those links. Can you share with them? Okay, sir. Wo jo tha na, diabetes wala jo seminar tha. Yes. Beta cells. I want these students to, you know, take your time. Uh, you know, it will take time to understand these seminars and, you know, but watch them. Uh, to, it will, it will, it should make you more curious about this whole course. One is about diabetes. I would say start with the diabetes one. That, that is interesting one because you can correlate with the disease. You can correlate with, you know, um, the origin of diabetes. Okay, how it initiates, how and how can we, you know, using regenerative medicine, stem cells, how can we actually uh, try to cure without insulin? Uh, you know, how patient cells can be used to, uh, the stem cell therapy can be used to uh, cure diabetes. Uh, so watch first diabetic one and then watch the Helge Grossens where, which is more complex about developmental clock. Uh, that will give you an idea about uh, the power of the model systems because I'm going to cover a lot uh, about fruit flies because major chunk of developmental biology about morphogen gradients uh, is actually coming from fruit flies. Uh, but we don't touch upon C. elegans and I would like you to uh, watch Helge's seminar, which will <clears throat> give you an idea about power of using these uh, model systems and how can we answer different questions linked to developmental biology. Any questions, please? Questions? Hmm? I'll place all my lectures on uh, um, biology department's YouTube. Uh, I'll share with you the link, but uh, remember, uh, don't miss lectures uh, because watching videos will not be enough. Uh, it's a difficult course. It's a very difficult course. It's, it's the last course in your uh, core curriculum in biology before moving into senior year. And it will help you a lot in your senior project as well. Uh, whether you join Dr. Fessel's lab, Dr. Shahzad's lab, uh, Dr. Khurram is a new outstanding guy. And he's going to establish Arabidopsis uh, plant molecular biology research group. And soon you will also have Dr. Schwab is coming from Denmark, who is chromatin and epigenetics guy working on cancer, etc. So don't miss any lecture, uh, but I'll place all the lectures on uh, YouTube, uh, because I know uh, it's difficult to learn everything looking on the screen and, you know, you lose attention, but um, you can go back on YouTube again, back and forth. And I observed in genetics course, for example, uh, which I taught last, uh, last uh, semester, uh, students were watching those videos a lot. Um, but I warned them and the ones who missed the lectures, they unfortunately uh, lost a lot during that course. So don't miss the course because I'll be using a lot of tools. I'll be going off uh, track many times and explaining things. Uh, so I, I will appreciate if you don't miss lectures, okay? If there are no more questions, then Allah Hafiz, 
or there are questions? There are no more questions. Allah Hafiz then have a good day.